now before, before I preach. And um, we're going to read from several passages, so just to be awkward. But uh, I wanted to read three different passages today. Um, the first one is from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. I'm sure you all know it anyway, but it's worth repeating. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When he saw them, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now we're going to read from Luke 14, verses 21 to 23. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. And then finally, we're going to read from Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 4. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Well, when Janice told me that I could choose this morning's message and when praying about it, almost immediately, the Lord said to me, remember what I sent you to do. It reminded me that when one of the elders asked me at, my, at uh, Pembury Baptist Church, asked me why I was going out to preach, I said rather to my own surprise, actually, because I hadn't really thought about it that I wanted to encourage people in smaller churches to do mission, to get out into the community that they live and work in. So here I am obeying the Lord's call for me and sharing God's word about life's mission to you as followers of Jesus. I want to start by bringing the late Prince Philip to you as an example of what mission and service for someone looks like. The Duke of Edinburgh, whether you liked him or hated him, was a man who had a clear mission in life. His mission had been to serve the Queen until she came to the, um, after she came to the throne in 1952. He gave up everything of his own career at that time and his role has been to love her and support her as a husband, as well as promoting her kingdom and its culture. 
to that, to do that, he faithfully supported and encouraged people of all ages in over 3,000 charities and businesses throughout the UK and the Commonwealth. And I'd like to say too that um, you two are also a wonderful example of a commitment to each other over 60 years. And that's a real blessing to those around you. Can you see the mission parallels in our lives as Christians? The church, those who follow Jesus are married to the Lamb. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul shares his hope for them. I promise you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. And in Revelation 19, 7 to 8, the angel explains to John, for the wedding of the Lord has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. The bride of Jesus is those who are saved and clothed in bright and clean linen, the righteousness or holiness on, uh, bestowed on the bride of, of, by Christ. Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth were married for 73 years. We've got a way to go yet. <laughs> An amazing earthly example. As the bride of Christ, we are to love Jesus and follow him all our days until death, and then forever and ever. Our role, our mission in life individually and collectively is to serve our husband, King Jesus, and to promote his kingdom, his culture, to support and help and encourage the people throughout his land. I wonder then how we see our role in life. I was really challenged by something that was said in a recent meeting. What do we reply when we're asked what we do? I might say I'm an administrator or a minister. We might say, well, I'm a mother or a father. I'm a doctor or an engineer. How do we define our role in life? The person said in the meeting, if we're asked what our role in life is, why don't we say, I'm a Christian? Isn't that what defines us? Isn't our faith the primary role in our lives? Isn't that what then drives us to be a mother, a minister, a refuse collector, a doctor, an engineer? I realise that it would be very odd to say I'm a Christian if somebody asks you what you do. But it challenged me and it made me ask myself, what is my primary mission, my role? What is it and what's it based on? So now here I am asking you, what is your primary mission in life, your role? Is it following Jesus first and everything else about us being defined from serving him? Or is it me and my ambition, my needs first and Jesus on a Sunday or if, it all, or if all else fails? Well, we follow Jesus. What was his mission then? At Easter and when we gather for Holy Communion, we particularly reflect on the death and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate the completion of God's mission for his son. Jesus freely undertook that mission of human birth, of life, death and resurrection to save us, to give us life as we've already heard, in place of death. Jesus had complete trust in his Father and his Father's will. We only have to think of his prayer in Gethsemane as he sweat blood. 
That's in Matthew 26, verse 39. My father, if it were possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Because of that trust, there could be no risk of his mission failing. The crucifixion wasn't the end for Jesus. He trusted implicitly that his father would raise him from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus encapsulated his father's mission and will when he told Nicodemus the way of salvation. And you know the way well. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God's mission was to open a way for sinners where there was no other possible way. He did it by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to live an untainted life, to die, to take on every sin of those who were to believe in him. The verses before 14 to 15 say this, the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Not only did Jesus die, but through the power of the Holy Spirit was raised from the dead, overcoming sin and death. His mission of love and mercy was complete. So where does that leave us? I've just said that Jesus completed his mission, so what's left for us? When I first became a Christian, I'd prayed for three years that I might know the salvation of the Lord personally. I felt, and that's true, that I'd got to know Jesus myself. God answered my prayer. He said to my heart through his word in Acts 8, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest, that is, I could be baptized because I believed with all my heart. But I sort of thought that that was all there was to it. I only understood the tiniest fraction of the journey. I was at the start of my eternal journey with Jesus, not the end. I didn't realize that I could find such, such joy in the love of Jesus or that I would love him because he first loved me. I didn't understand that I would serve the Lord with my life for his honor and glory. I thought that in knowing I was saved by Jesus, that was it, that life would just go on in salvation. Well, of course it didn't. I had much more to learn and I'm still learning now 46 years later. Do you know you're saved? through the life and death of Jesus. Where are you now on that journey? At the foot of the cross, as we lay our sin and burdens down and received a, receive a renewed life through the death and resurrection of Jesus, our mission is to take on the yoke of Christ, to take his word and his love to all the world. Jesus calls us to come to him, all of us who are weary and burdened, and he will give us rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Matthew 11. So we rest in Jesus by going to him with our burdens. But there's more. He asks us to take his yoke on us. What is his yoke? It's not the same as Janice was popping into the jug. But what is his yoke? Well, I've always liked Rob's, Rob Bell's explanation. 
he says that the yoke of a rabbi was the body of his teaching, his interpretation of God's word. And when Jews became disciples of a particular rabbi, they took on the yoke of that rabbi. So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, when he says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, he's saying that when we become his followers, we're to take up his teaching, his way, take up his truth and life and follow him, serve him and undertake his mission. And that therein is rest. If you take no other encouragement or strength from this sermon, take that home and think about it. If we put on the yoke of Jesus, we find rest. I find great joy in that. Our mission is the same as that of Christ, to take up his yoke and learn from him. Do we think perhaps that we haven't been called to the ministry or to church work? The call on our lives to continue in God's mission began when we became a Christian. The Great Commission, the words Jesus said at the end of Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you. There's the rest. Surely I am with you always at the, to the very end of the age. This is to all Jesus' disciples, not just those that were there at the time. We are also his disciples and are to take God's word to his people. We are to take God's love with his authority to those who need him. Where we have the opportunity to do so, we should be listening for him noticing where he's working god so loved the world we should love it too isaiah 61 the verses that we read are a prophecy of christ's work his mission it's also our mission we're to work in the mission of god for his kingdom we're not saving the world that's already been done by Jesus, that was his mission. Only the Son of God could accomplish the salvation of sinners and the renewal of the world. We are, however, called to join in God's work, in his world, getting involved in what God is doing. It has nothing to do with our own agenda in life. It's God's agenda. It's his work. His work is fulfilled through loving people and his creation, just as he loved us. God is at work before, during and after we get there. We simply support his work. We should be listening and noticing what God is doing in our communities. What opportunities is God opening up? in our family life or in our work life? Where, where can we bind up the brokenhearted? Where can we proclaim good news to the poor? There are so many opportunities. We all have neighbors, family, friends, sports, other organizations that we're part of. There are residential homes for the elderly, there are those with mental health needs, addictions, prisoners, the list goes on and on. Ask God what area of his mission he wants you to support and encourage, where you can show practical love 
to the whole of his earth, people and nature alike. We're called to be in service for him, to show the glory of God where we are. And you're probably thinking, well, that's all very well, Jennifer. You're a minister, you have a voice. I'm not called to that. How on earth am I supposed to do mission? Well, mission isn't for extraordinary people or people with a special call. Remember Matthew 25, 35 to 40, in the story about the sheep and the goats? What did Jesus say was important? It wasn't complicated or preachy or showing enormous courage. We just have to respond to who we know with what we see through God's eyes. He said this, for I, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the king replies, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That's the king's mission for you. We can see how what Jesus says in Matthew 25 chimes with Isaiah 61. Listen and notice and respond in love. Be in the business of blessing people. You might just take a bunch of flowers to your neighbors. You might just pick up some litter in the road. You may have a heart for praying for the persecuted church. Don't think just because you're older that you can't do mission. You have the opportunity to pray. You have time. You have time to seek the name of the Lord, to ask him for where you can do mission for him, where his glory is going to come, where his kingdom is going to be. But you know how an acorn grows into a great oak tree. And who knows that when you plant a little acorn, just a word of love or a bunch of flowers, whether that person will grow into a great oak of righteousness, giving glory and splendor to the Lord God. You certainly will have. So we just need to love people as Christ loves us unconditionally and sacrificially, not for ourselves, but to give glory to God and to further his kingdom. We have a wonderful radical message to share, whether we do it through preaching, but most of all, by practicing what we preach. And in the end, God is sovereign. It's not what we do, it's what our Heavenly Father does with what we do. That's mission. We'll find rest in it, and it'll be transformative for the glory of God. Amen. Now James is going to lead us again. Right, so we will close by singing, I am who you say I am. <laughs>